911, what's the emergency? I, I, I can't find my daughter. Location of emergency? I can't find my daughter. Okay, how old is she? Nine. Okay, she didn't go to school today? No, we were just getting ready to go and she went outside to play for a while because she was done early. I, I can't find her. She's a white female? Yes, a little redhead. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to a new episode of Love and Murder, the weekly true crime podcast discussing relationships gone terribly wrong, where our motto is, you're either someone's last love or their first murder. I am your host, Kai, and this show discusses true crime cases told in the form of a story with mystery and suspense. Be sure to subscribe to Love and Murder on Spotify, Apple, or whatever platform you're on so you don't miss any of the cases. If you didn't know, you could also subscribe to our Patreon so that you don't have to hear an intro or commercials. In today's episode, I'm talking about a case of a missing child. The mother of the missing girl had a history of drug abuse and had apparently left the family when the baby was just two years old. But those who knew the mother didn't believe that she would ever abandon her child. Was the mother back to claim her child? Or had something even worse happened? But first, I want to remind you to head on over to our exclusive group at patreon.com forward slash love and murder. We have so much going on in there. Bonus episodes, bonuses of full episodes, and our upcoming bonus episode is a roundup of the craziest crimes. I'll tell you more about this at the end of today's episode. Now, grab your butts and grab your apple juice and let's get into today's episode of Love and Murder. Now, to truly understand the events that happened in October 1999, I gotta first tell you about the troubled past of the Jackson family. It all started on September 29th, 1992, seven years before this current case in Spokane, Washington. Now answer me this, is it Spokane? Cause I hear some people saying Spokane. Or is it Spokane? Cause it's spelled Spokane. So I would like to know. But anyway, this is going on in Spokane, Washington. A 35-year-old woman named Roseanne Pleasant, who was the girlfriend of William Bradley Jackson, also called Brad, vanished without a trace. Roseanne was no stranger to a risky lifestyle because she did drugs, she did prostitution, and both of these can be very dangerous. Roseanne had four children, but her youngest, Valerie Jackson, who she'd had with Brad, was only two years old at this time. Rumor had it that months before September, she had witnessed the murder of a fellow sex worker, and this kind of fed into people thinking this is why she she disappeared. There were a lot of rumors going around, but this was one of them. The last time she'd been seen was at a corner store, and a week before that, She'd called her brother to tell him that she feared for her safety and was going to take three of her four kids and move down south. The reason she was only taking three of her four kids was because Brad had primary custody of Valerie with Roseanne only having supervised visitation. Now, the last person who had heard from her was her brother and the last person who had seen her was her boyfriend, Brad. Police had questioned both of them And they had deemed Brad as a person of interest because of what Roseanne's brother, John Stone, had said. He told them about their last phone conversation and everything like that. So that kind of raised suspicion with the police. There were also reports that there was physical abuse going on in the home, including an arrest for domestic violence. Now, during that investigation, Brad wasn't very cooperative and refused the polygraph test, and the case was just marked as, quote, missing persons, and that was it. Open and kind of shut case, Johnson. Let's move on with our lives. I'm sure she'll turn up. So back to the current day of the case. On what should have been a normal October morning in 1999, Brad Jackson woke up and went about his day. 
His nine-year-old daughter, Valerie, was playing outside in the front yard of his parents' house where they were currently living while the father, Brad, was inside just doing some laundry and everything. He had just run inside. She had just come home from school. He had just run inside to do some errands and, you know, chores, whatever, and then he was going to come back out. But when he came back outside, he didn't see Valerie. What he saw instead was her backpack that was right by the front door, but nothing else was around. So trying not to panic, which I could understand, Brad ran around asking the neighbors if they'd seen her, but everyone said no. So the police were called, and before long, the entire small community of Spokane Valley, Washington, had banded together to help search for a missing girl within a two-mile radius of the house. It was never clear if Brad checked back at the McDonald Elementary School, just a few blocks from their house, But either way, neighbors and everybody were out looking for Valerie. Now, Spokane Valley might be a small town, but it's actually seen its fair share of horrible events, such as multiple bank robberies and bombings just a few years, bombings just a few years before. And this all had come down to, uh, group of domestic terrorists, I guess, called the Phineas Priesthood. They were the ones doing all of this. This actually ended up being featured on an episode of Forensic Files. So you can go ahead and look that up. It's called Line of Fire. That's what the episode is called. So with all the searching going on and everything, Valerie still couldn't be found. One of the things that immediately stood out to investigators was exactly how well Brad was able to describe his daughter's clothes that she was wearing, even though he was in panic mode. Also, being that this happened before to the exact same person, and he was very uncooperative at the time, police decided that the best course of action was to immediately look into Brad. For this investigation, though, instead of letting Brad know right away that they suspected him, they first looked through the house. The first thing they found were blood stains on Valerie's sheets and pillows. Upon further investigation, they found two red pubic hairs, adult pubic hairs, on her bed, which Brad's hair is red, and blood stains on Brad's sneakers as well. However, there was no other evidence, so a week later, they got a search warrant for Brad's car. They searched the cars and returned them to Brad, but they had a little present there for him, which was a GPS tracker. They had a GPS embedded in his car, and they tracked Brad for 18 days. Quote, it was very serious to us. Our whole purpose was to use everything in our capability to determine the whereabouts of Valerie Jackson, end quote. This was said by Lieutenant Doug Silver. Before they started tracking him, they put pressure on him by bringing him in for questioning. And he had an answer for everything. Remember I pointed out how well Brad described Valerie's outfit? Well, investigators believe that this was an attempt to make his story more convincing if her body was ever discovered. When they pointed out the pubic hairs they found, Brad claimed that pubic hairs, quote, migrate within a home. But I mean, later investigators did an experiment that showed that the migration of these hairs from an adult's bedroom to a child's is actually very uncommon. I mean, I guess it could happen one out of a thousand times or something like that. But I could have told you that without even an experiment. You could have just called me up and I could have told you no. As much times as I've cleaned my daughter's bedrooms, I can count on zero fingers how many times I found an adult pubic hair in her freaking room. Anyways, when they then told him about the blood stains on her pillow and bed, Brad claimed they were from a nosebleed that she had the night before she disappeared. However, there was no additional evidence of stopping a nosebleed because there was no tissues around, no toilet papers, no towels, nothing. So back to the GPS. When they followed the places the GPS went, it revealed a 
journey. So before I go into this, I can understand why they kind of put the screws to Brad because they kind of probably wanted to scare him or whatever. They didn't want him to think that he was all the all the oxen free. They wanted him to think that they wanted him to know that now they suspected him, you know? So they look at the GPS on October 6th. Brad drove 60 miles out to a wooded area northwest of his home in Springdale near a logging site. There he stayed for 44 minutes. Then he drove down Highway 27 to a secluded foothill only 10 miles away from his house. There he stayed for 16 minutes. Police then followed the GPS tracker and at the Highway 27 location found a grave Though it was empty, but there were plastic bags that were used to bury Valerie sitting right next to the hole. Like, why don't you just leave a sign? Police kept watching the tracker. Days before the warrant for the GPS expired, the GPS data showed that Brad's truck had spent 16 minutes in the wooded area outside of Springdale. The significance of this location became clear when, on November 15th, 1999, Valerie's lifeless body was discovered. So what it looked like is that she was buried close to his house, 10 miles out of his house. And when he figured police were on to him, he went and dug her up, drove the 60 miles out, buried her there. So that's, that's what it sounds like. Well, that's what it looks like based on GPS tracking and where everything was found. On Thursday, November 18th, Brad was arrested, charged with first degree murder, and held on a $1 million bail and under suicide watch. Now I know you're asking, Kai, why suicide watch? Thanks for asking. Well, there was another case of a child disappearing in Spokane Valley while with their father. The case of 11-year-old Christopher Wood in January of the same year was very similar to this case. However, when the child's body was found and the father, Robert Wood, was arrested, he committed suicide while in jail and awaiting trial. So, they had Brad on suicide watch because you ain't getting away that easy. During the autopsy, the medical examiner saw bruising around Valerie's nose and mouth. Now, in the meantime, all this is happening. Brad's co-workers are like beyond shocked. They described Brad as an excellent father who was always in his daughter's life. Whenever they saw him, they saw her. Currently, he'd been collecting disability checks from the steel fabrication company he worked at due to suffering a back injury while he'd been at a water park with Valerie in August. Investigators heard this, but they painted a completely different picture of Brad, of a guy who was sexually abusing his daughter. They also reopened the investigation into Roseanne's disappearance because, I mean, similarities much? In the meantime, when investigators interviewed Brad, he admitted that he killed Valerie, but you don't understand. It was completely an accident. And... Why did I not call 911 since this was accidental? Um, uh, just give me a second while I come up with that answer. Like, really? Accident? Really? So here's his real excuse. This is what he actually said. That one, that part I made up. But this is what he actually said. He said that Valerie was on Paxil to help control some behavioral problems. So for those of you who don't know, according to drugs.com, Paxil, also called paroxetine, quote, is an antidepressant that belongs to group of drugs called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs. Paroxetine affects chemicals in the brain that may be unbalanced in people with depression, anxiety, or other disorders. Paxil is used to treat depression, including major depressive disorder. Paxil is also used to treat panic disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, and premenstrual diphoric disorder. Now, the other thing you need to know is that this is not recommended for children or teens without serious caution as it's a strong psychotropic drug. With that being said, Valerie was seeing a counselor, Lori Miller, because Brad's girlfriend at the time recommended that she go. 
Dr. Peter Holden said that because of Lori's and Brad's concern over Valerie's depression, he thought it was best to prescribe Paxil. Quote, I generally prefer not to use it, but the medication has been effective many times. On top of all of this, Brad's girlfriend and Valerie didn't get along. The thing is, though, everyone described Valerie as a sweet and loving child. However, Brad labeled her as difficult because she didn't get along with his girlfriend. So she was probably being sexually assaulted and not getting along with the girlfriend. And to me, these are valid reasons why a child will be acting out or feeling depressed, or maybe she felt that the the father took the girlfriend's side or loved the girlfriend more than her, you know? So this is why I'm thinking the depression or the acting out or whatever Basically, no need for medication, just need for somebody to slap the dad and tell him to get his shit together. But I digress. The doctor wouldn't have known this, so I can't judge him. During the time that Valerie was in therapy, Danette, Brad's girlfriend, broke up with him. Anyway, Brad said he accidentally killed her because she accidentally overdosed on Paxil. He said he panicked and decided that the best course of action was to try and cover it up. Police didn't believe this accidental claim. Due to the autopsy, they deduced that Brad intentionally smothered her by covering her nose and mouth. The motive, however, was still a bit shaky. While Brad was in jail awaiting his trial, he called Danette and proposed to her. After the murder of his child, while he was in jail for said murder, will you marry me? Really? During the trial around November 2000, the motive was pieced together from investigators. They believed that Brad thought that Danette left him because of Valerie. Supposedly, he killed Valerie hoping that this would help get his woman back. Seriously? Like she would be like, oh baby, you killed your child. I'm coming right back to you. (gasps) Swoon, my heart. Yeah. Yeah. Defense attorneys argued that Valerie died from an overdose of Paxil and that Brad became so distraught that it turned to irrationality, which in turn made him bury, dig up, and then rebury his daughter. Ah, the irrationality. Ah. Again, as I always wonder, how do these lawyers defend people that they know are guilty? And he killed his daughter, and you're defending him. While in jail... Brad has sent his family two letters. In one, he said that some random guy named Craig kidnapped Valerie. The only reason he'd gone to the logging company was to meet this guy. When he got there, a voice in a tree, which was Craig supposedly, told him that Valerie was dead and where to find her. Then he said, ninja vanish. No, he didn't say that part. And to those of you who try to come at me for laughing, bite me. I'm not laughing that a child is dead, obviously. I'm laughing that a stupid murderer thought that this stupidity would fly in court, that the the judge, the lawyers, the cops, everybody was so stupid that this is what they were going to believe. I'm getting tired of you non-lambs not knowing the distinction. The rest of you, the lambs, y'all are smart and amazing. Anyway, then the supposed Craig told Brad not to say anything because I'm watching you 24-7 and if you say anything to anyone, I will find you and more harm will come to your family. End quote. Literally. That's what he said that this phantom guy that he just suddenly remembered after he was arrested said to him. Then he ended the letter to his family by saying, quote, this is literally a quote, Hope you all could read my writing. At least it's better than mom's. Ha ha ha. Ho ho ho. He he he. Dude, your daughter's dead. Seriously? And y'all come at me for laughing? A pediatrician also came to testify against the defense of a Paxil overdose, saying that shortness of breath is common in depressed children and not from the complications with with Paxil. Dr. Barry Logan also testified that there was not enough Paxil in her system to warn an overdose. Oh, what you going to say now, Brad? Dave Heron, Brad's lawyer. Okay, well, I guess this is what he's going to come back with. 
argued that using GPS raised on constitutional questions. Quote, there has to be some checks and balance with a device like that. What's the next step? How far is law enforcement allowed to go? Maybe the next time they'll put something in our wallets and purses and watch us from space. End quote. Dude, they just debunked your client and yours defense that she was killed from an overdose of Paxil. That's your next tactic? I guess the jury agrees with me because Brad was found guilty and sentenced to 56 years in prison for first degree murder. He's since tried to appeal his conviction in 2019 and 2003, but the courts showed him both middle fingers and upheld it every time. Since this case, the FDA has required a black box warning on antidepressants and other medications for an increased risk of suicide in children and young adults. Also, although the pubic hair were matched to Brad's, yes, they were later on matched to Brad's, there was never an explanation given as to how they got in Valerie's bed and literally nothing was done with this investigate uh, with this information. I think they should have tried to investigate that more and then done something with that. Quote, this is hard for me to say. I honestly believe Brad deserves what he took from Valerie and that's a life sentence. End quote. Which is a quote from Brad's brother, Dick Jackson. Roseanne's body has never been found and no one has been charged with her death. Her brother thinks that Brad killed her and buried her in one of his construction sites that he used to work at. He said that Roseanne was terrified of Brad. Her case is currently listed as, quote, endangered missing. And that is the case of Brad Jackson. His daughter is dead and his daughter's mother is still missing. What do you think of this episode? I'd love to hear your thoughts and you have three ways of sharing them with me. Number one, you could tell me in the comments below. Number two, you can join the Lamb Facebook group. It's free and a welcoming group where you can discuss the cases with the rest of the Lambs. Number three, you can join the exclusive Lamb community here at www.patreon.com forward slash love and murder. Right now, right now, we have options starting at only $1 a month. Speaking of which, if you join Patreon at only $1 a month, you get commercial free episodes. So all the commercials that were in here, all the commercials that were in the beginning of the episode, everything, you don't have to deal with that. You also get the additions to the case. So like pictures, if there's video of the interrogation, if there's pictures of like um, the crime scene, if there's pictures of the evidence, just whatever. For instance, in episode 100, dude, it's worth it just to go in Patreon and look at those pictures. Even the lambs who knew about Ed Gein said I had pictures in there that they'd never seen before. So it's worth it to just get in at that dollar and see those pictures. And if you get in now at that dollar, you will be grandfathered in because very soon, very, very soon, I haven't decided when, but when I do, I'm gonna let you know the date. That tier is actually going to go up. But if you get in, you'll be grandfathered in at the $1 a month. So imagine $1 a month and all those extras, you're going to get it. However, the best tier is for the $5 a month and above, because not only do you get all of this, but you also get bonus episodes and access to everything that I post throughout the week. So you'll get current bonus episodes, past bonus episodes, all the way from when we first started the Patreon to now, you'll get all of that. And you get all of this here in this one little community. www.patreon.com forward slash love and murder. Come on over. I'd love to have you. Before you go, don't forget to give me a five-star review on whatever platform you're on. That would help me out greatly. And it takes zero time at all. Just hit five stars. Five, five, five. Just, just, just hit it. The start right there. Five stars. Thank you. Follow us on social media. All the links are in the show notes below. You can go down there and say, I've given, taken enough of your time. So just look in the show notes below. You'll find all the social media. Follow us there, especially Instagram or Twitter. That's where I am mostly or our Facebook group. That's the other place I am mostly. And a free and easy way to help me out is by simply sharing this episode. Just share, share with your mom, share with your dad, 
Share with your brother, sister, cousin, friend. Share with your dog. Share, 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 share. And as always, I end each episode by reminding you that it's, say it with me now, all love and no murder, y'all. Bye. Bye.